Hi, this is Arya Cohen Wade, and I'm your host today on Culturally Determined for a very special episode, maybe the most special episode of Culturally, Culturally Determined ever, uh, with my guest Rebecca Lonis. Rebecca, could you introduce yourself? Hi, yeah, I am the behavior and training manager at Lollipop Farm, and also married to you. <laughs> okay, so let's take the second part of that first. Uh, yes, we are we are in fact married. Um, but this is not a, a mere vanity episode of Culturally Determined. Uh, we're going to be talking to you uh, in, you know, not not as um, wife of Arya Conway, but as behavior and training manager at Lollipop Farm. And what, what is Lollipop Farm? Lollipop Farm is a mid-sized open admission animal shelter in Rochester, New York. So that means that we accept any animal uh except for wildlife. So any domesticated animal that people keep as pets, we uh, accept and shelter. And um, we don't have a geographic limitation. So sometimes we get animals as far away as Long Island, uh, Pennsylvania. People drive a long way to bring us their pets. Right. And this is, this is uh, outside of Rochester, New York. Um, so thank you uh, for coming on today. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, animal behavior, uh, animal shelters, uh, learning theory, uh, common misperceptions about animals and shelters and things along those lines. Um, and I guess uh, the first question would be, how did you end up working at a animal shelter in Rochester, New York? So to tell you my story in a nutshell, I grew up on a farm in southern Illinois and my dad's a veterinarian. So I grew up helping in the clinic and playing with my dogs and cats and cows out on the farm. And I always had a strong interest in animal behavior. And I knew that I wasn't interested in being a veterinarian because I could see what my dad did and I wasn't interested in doing that. Um, I wanted to focus more on uh, behavior. Um, so I did my undergraduate degree at Yale. I uh, have a bachelor's in biology. That's where I met you. This is true. Um, so from Yale, I got into wild animal behavior and worked as a field biologist for a while in between undergraduate and graduate school. Then I went to graduate school at Cornell and I have a master's from there. And during that time, I was studying the breeding behavior of a ground nesting bird species, the common nighthawk, uh, which is a really cool bird, but it's not as, um, Terrifying as it sounds, it's not. A, <laughs> it doesn't fly at night, uh, but their nests are really hard to find. And so, someone gave me the idea to train a dog to help me find the nests. Oh, it's Grumpkin. Yeah, Grumpkin is making a cameo as she often does. Oh boy. <laughs> um, so anyway, so I got a puppy and I trained her, and that's our dog Lima. And she worked with me in the field. And it was really fun training her and working with her. So she's, and, she's an English setter, which is a type of bird, you know, bred for uh, hunting, for hunting birds. Exactly. Um, so through training her and living with her, I sort of rediscovered my original interest in animal behavior was dogs and cats and cows. Um, I had also always had an interest in animal sheltering. So I had volunteered at an animal shelter in high school. As soon as I got my license, I was driving to volunteer at the local animal shelter where I was the only volunteer and they only let me volunteer because they knew my dad because he did vet work for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started volunteering at a shelter when I was in graduate school. And at around the same time, this field of shelter behavior was becoming a professional field. And once I learned that that was an option uh, to do as a career, basically being um an animal behavior professional in a shelter, I knew that that was the job that I was meant to do. So I became, after I graduated with my master's, I worked as the behavior and training manager at the Tompkins County SPCA in Ithaca for a little over a year. And then I've been up here at Lollipop for a little over seven years. Cool. Um, so yeah, so you said this is kind of a, a new field. Um, and, you know, I think probably for most people, if they know one, the name of one dog trainer who like isn't their dog trainer, it's Cesar Milan. Mm -hmm. um, he's not, I think he's, he, I mean, he's, he's fallen out of favor somewhat. Uh, he's, he's not as famous as he used to be, but he used to have a show, I think it was on Nas National Geographic 
channel um, called The Dog Whisperer, and he wrote a couple books. Um, and he had this, you know, kind of um, particular philosophy of dog training. Like he he himself never had any formal training. Like he picked picked it up, you know, through, through his life and living with a lot of dogs. And I, I think he was born in Mexico and immigrated to the United States. And he, um, you know, part of his thing was like you need to be, you know, dogs come from wolves and those are pack animals, and you need to be like the um, alpha in your pack you know your household is your pack you need to be the alpha because if you're not the dog will like assume that role and start trying to like tell you what to do so this is the is kind of stuff and then he, he so he has a lot one of his big emphasis emphases is um exercise you know dogs need a lot of exercise but also he talks about like uh, corrections that you should give either verbally or um with your hand kind of any if you've ever seen the show you see him do these kind of um pokes at the animal while he make, makes a little noise. Sorry, Grumpkin is deciding to really put on a show, knocking things over on the desk. Maybe she hears me. <laughs> it's possible. Um, yeah, so 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 that was um, you know ten years ago around the time we got Lima. Uh, Cesar Milan was like was was the guy. He was the dog whisperer. Mal- Malcolm Gladwell wrote an article about him in the New Yorker that really made him out to be like a genius. Um, this is a really long treatise on Caesar Milan. Okay, but here's well, I'm setting it up. I'm setting him up, him up for a fall. Like Caesar Milan is wrong, according to you and most other people who know what they're talking about. So why is Caesar Milan wrong? Okay, so um, that was a quite the oral history of Caesar Milan. <laughs> I commend you for that. Um, so Caesar Milan, I honestly haven't talked about him with clients in over a year. He's definitely not as popular as he used to be. Basically, um, he uses force and pain and intimidation and fear to change behavior. And, um, you know, we always, so people who are professional um, animal behavior professionals, uh, we really focus more on using positive reinforcement. We know that we can change behavior using positive reinforcement. We don't have to use force and pain and intimidation. It's never necessary to correct an issue. Um, I think that we can talk a little bit about certifications. So dog training is kind of, it's an unregulated industry. Anybody can hang up their shingle and call themselves a dog trainer. They don't have to have any formal certifications or licensing. Um, So those of us, who are doing it professionally typically do seek out independent certifications. Um, To my knowledge, he doesn't have any. I mean, you do have to look at the sort of certifying body and whether they're reputable as well. So um, for example, I have two certifications through the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants, which is an organization that is popular in the United States and also in the UK and Ireland um, and somewhat internationally beyond that as well. Um, So I'm a certified dog behavior consultant through them and I'm a associate certified cat behavior consultant. And, you know, both of those uh, application processes, you had to have worked in the field for a certain number of years. You had to have letters of recommendation from multiple sources. You had to have an extensive written application that demonstrated uh, the depth and breadth of your knowledge. And it was pretty extensive. And something like that, um, you're not going to be able to get if you don't know your science and you don't know um, the science of behavior change in particular. You know, Cesar Milan, I think he's charismatic. I think it's in human nature to want to punish things when they don't do what we want them to do. So I think that a lot of people are sort of gravitate towards the correctional methods just because of human nature. Like we want to be able to to express our displeasure at other people or at animals when they do things that we don't like. And it that actually that expression of displeasure actually gets reinforced because typically we see the animal change their behavior in that moment in time. They stop doing what they're doing. They look at us. But over time, what can happen is that those methods can erode your relationship with your animal. So over time, they might become afraid of you. You might see an increase in anxiety or aggression. And all of these have been borne out in study after study that showed that the type of methods that Cesar Milan practices can lead to increased behavior issues instead of decreased. 
and they can really hurt your bond with your pet. And so that's not something that um, I would personally um, ever do, and it's not something that Lollipop Farm as a policy would would do. Okay. Um, so can you talk about the positive punishment, negative punishment, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement um, paradigm for so what, what, is, what is that? How do you explain that to someone who's never heard of it before? Sure. Um, how I explain it depends on the context. So for most of my training clients, it, they almost they don't need to know these terms because the terms are confusing in and of themselves. But I'll sort of explain it for the viewers. Um, we have a well-educated audience, so. Okay, uh, so <laughs> for those of you out here who maybe took a behavioral science course in college or, you know, a course in learning theory. So these terms he's referring to are part of what's called learning theory. And there's these four quadrants. You have punishment, you have reinforcement, and you have positive and negative. So punishment means that you want the behavior directly before the punishment to decrease in frequency. So if it's a behavior you want to go away, um, you might use punishment for that. Um, reinforcement means that the behavior directly preceding that reinforcement is going to increase in frequency. So you're using reinforcement when you, when you want the behavior to happen more, you use punishment when you want it to happen less. There are lots of nuances to that that we can talk about um, in terms of how you use them, but negative and positive simply means that you're adding something or you're subtracting something. So it's not a moral judgment, whether it's positive or negative, it's just a valence, it's positive or negative. So Positive reinforcement is a simple one. Everybody knows um, it's your paycheck. So it's an additional thing coming into the situation that increases the frequency or the likelihood of the behavior directly preceding it. So, um, you know, positive reinforcement is, like I said, your paycheck. You uh, give your dog a cookie when they sit. That's positive reinforcement. Um, negative reinforcement is when something Typically, it's something scary goes away or something bad goes away to make the behavior happen more frequently. So in animal training, sometimes this happens when you um, are working with a fearful animal and you're actually scary to the animal. And if you move away, that can reinforce them moving towards you. So they take a step towards you and you take a step back. That's one way we use negative reinforcement uh, for people. Uh, one of the best examples I've heard about negative reinforcement is um, actually uh, urinating. So when you have a full bladder and you really need to urinate, that <laughs> feeling is is um, negative reinforcement. So it's usually tied to like a sense of relief or, you know, you're getting some kind of respite from something bad mm -hmm. that is aversive. Um, so positive let's see, let's move on to negative punishment. Um, negative punishment is typically when, again, punishment means you want the behavior to decrease. Negative means you're taking something away. And in dog training in particular, the classic thing is if a dog jumps on you, they want your attention. So you can turn away and ignore them. So you're taking the thing that they want your attention away from them. And that will mean that in the future, they're less likely to jump on you. Um, Again, there's a lot of nuance to this in terms of how well rehearsed is the behavior. We could talk about variable reinforcement schedules. Um, it depends on what direction you want to go in. But let me finish with positive mm -hmm. punishment. And that is when you are adding something aversive into the situation in order to make the behavior decrease. So Cesar Milan mostly lives in this quadrant. And basically, you're adding in something that the animal doesn't like, something that they will work to avoid in order to change a behavior. So um, this could be, you know, something like the dog doesn't sit when you ask him to, so you smack him or you push his butt down on the ground. Uh, so you're adding in um, an aversive stimulus. So, you know, shock collar training, a lot of it is in this realm. Some of it could be in the negative reinforcement realm. Again, it gets, it can get, very complicated. It's not that complicated because it's a little complicated when you're looking at specific situations. Mm -hmm. um, but within that, with animal training, um, we 
here at Lollipop and in general, a lot of professionals follow what's called a humane hierarchy, which looks at um, what order should you consider using these different behavioral interventions in. So it doesn't just have those four quadrants. Um, it has other things, and we can put a link to um, a graphic that shows this really, really well. But basically, you want to evaluate your training plans by going up this humane hierarchy. And it was originally created by Susan Friedman based on a similar humane hierarchy that they use for um, working with special needs kids and adults. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at you want the least intrusive, um, least stressful. Sorry, the cat in here is meowing now too. <laughs> That's okay. Stephanie, you want to come up here? Yeah, come on. Yeah. Maybe Persephone will make an appearance. <laughs> He's available for adoption. <laughs> so um, anyway, so you want to look at the, the least intrusive, minimally aversive. So that's Lima, which is the name of our dog coincidentally, but it's a framework for looking at uh, your training plans. You want to go from, uh, you know, the least amount of residual or uh, coincidental stress to the animal or the learner Um you want to try all those options before you escalate to any kind of um, aversive. And for me, for myself, I um, ethically would not use positive punishment on an animal um, within the context of a training plan. Um, you know, something like a really good example I heard once was, you know, if the dog is like walking towards a that are in like a sawmill and they're walking towards a table saw and they're about to get cut. Am I going to pull that dog back quickly and might that scare them a bit? Like, yes, but I wouldn't use it deliberately within the context of a training plan. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, yeah, that's a good overview of learning theory and how it applies. Um, just for one other, one more point on why Caesar Milan is wrong. Can you talk about the alpha, alpha dog wolf pack stuff and why that's wrong? Sure. So the original research for the the basis of the style of training was done in the 70s by this guy, David Meech, and he did studies, he oversaw studies of wolves in these giant pens. So they were unrelated wolves in these enclosures. They couldn't get away from each other. Um, so they formed these dominance hierarchies and they were all reinforced through um aggression. So there was a very strict pecking order and the wolves at the top used a lot of aggression to keep the wolves in the middle and the bottom in line. And people looked at those studies and said, okay, so wolves are like that. And they just, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about in a second why that might not be true. But from there they said, well, if wolves are like that, dogs must be like that. And if dogs are like that with each other, then we must need to be really rough with our dogs in order to keep them in line because each dog is this Machiavellian genius who really <laughs> just wants to run the world and take everything over. And there are a lot of leaps in logic there. Um, and what happened was a couple of things. So they, they were able to study wolves in the wild uh, a, like a decade after that uh, using radio telemetry. And they found that wolves in the wild actually live in family groups. So there's a mom and a dad and kids of various ages. Um, and they're mostly pretty peaceful. So they don't have all this aggression with each other. There's not a lot of aggression. Like the wolves in the pens wanted to disperse, couldn't disperse. So there was a lot of fighting and a, a lot of uh, aggression that wasn't a natural thing to see. It wasn't a normal thing to see. So even setting all of that aside, those are wolves and we live with domesticated dogs and they've done actual, some, some studies have been done on um, feral dogs. So domesticated dogs who've gone wild and they don't live in stable groups. So they don't form stable hierarchies. So there's really no scientific basis to say that your dog is secretly scheming to like, take over the direct deposit on your paycheck and like <laughs> decide what happens with the money in your house. Um, for every example of the older style of dog trainers who say, well, the dog is doing this because he's being dominant. And I've heard everything from putting their paw on your foot 
or sitting on your foot to jumping on you to giving you direct eye contact. I've heard all of these things. Um, you know, people will say, well, he's trying to be dominant. And really, there's no scientific evidence that that is the case. And really, it, in an interaction with two animals and a limited resource, one animal gains control of the resource. And in that interaction, they're the dominant one. The one who didn't gain control of the resource is the submissive one. And it's not, it's just an, it's just a description of an interaction like that. So it's not a personality trait. Mm -hmm. It's not a label that's useful to put on a dog. Uh, most of the time when people say, I have a really dominant dog, it means that they have a dog who is not well-trained and has impulse control issues and is really confident usually. So they're really um, bold dogs. That's typically what I find when people say, oh, my dog is really dominant, that that's the type of dog that they mean, but it doesn't have anything to do with controlling a limited resource. It doesn't have anything to do with actual dominance. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so that whole line of thinking has been, you know, is to be thrown in, <laughs> thrown in the trash bin of history and um, probably led to uh, a lot of unnecessary uh, suffering on the parts of people and, and their animals. Right. Um, well, and I want to say it's, you know, I'm not saying that punitive methods don't work to change behavior. They, they do. Like, they do work in the sense that it's science. If you're using positive punishment, it will change a behavior. But there could have a lot of unintended side effects. And for me, um, you know, ethically, just because it's effective doesn't mean that we should use it as a treatment for our companion animals or even our working animals. Like it just, it's not necessary to change behavior, even though it's effective. We want to avoid these side effects of increased fear and aggression and anxiety. There's no reason to use it. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned, you know, like person a personality trait. Uh, one thing I've been wondering about is, is you know, obviously, like animals ha seem to have personalities, um, and you know, we have. So we, we uh, have two cats in our household. So Grumpkin was just on screen. And then there's another cat, uh, Johnny, who people who follow me on Twitter, Johnny is the photo of my avatar, but he never appears on screen uh, <laughs> on this program because he's scared and he very rarely will jump up on my desk. Uh, he likes spending a lot of time uh, under the bed. Um, he... You're making him sound like an awful hermit. Like Well, he, he, he's, he's a lot... He's, he's, I mean, he's social for much shorter periods of time than... Uh, Grumpkin, our other cat, who is much more social and uh, also seems more intelligent uh, than Johnny. Johnny's kind of a bit of a dim bulb. Um, so it seems like these, like, so what is the origin of, like, the differences in personality between different animals? Do we know anything about that, like, where it comes from? Was, like, Johnny, you know, he's just, he was just born a little bit slow and a little bit shy, or maybe did something scary happen to him? What, like, what is the best thought on this at, at this point? Um, I'm not 100% up to date on the animal personality literature, but back when I was in grad school, um, the thought was at the time, at least for dogs, that the main thing that they could they could see a genetic link to was this shyness, boldness axis. So genetically, you'll fall somewhere on this shyness, boldness, boldness axis where you're genetically more shy or you're genetically more bold. And... I think it's probably true for other traits as well. Um, but at that time, that was the only one that had been actually shown. But the way that I think of it is, you know, for any given trait, your genetics say you're going to fall between these goalposts. And then, you know, your experience is going to say, where are you in between the goalposts? Mm -hmm. So Johnny could have been genetically more shy than Grumpkin. And then his early, we know his early experiences weren't as enriched as Grumpkin because we got him as an older kitten. And so he probably didn't see as many people as she did when she was younger. He didn't get exposed to as many new things. So when he was in his critical socialization period, which is pretty young for cats, um, it's, it can end for some cats even like as early as six weeks. Oh, wow. You know, so if he didn't get all that exposure when he was this little sponge, so the critical socialization period, I should explain, is a period of time where 
a baby animal is naturally more playful and shows more exploratory behavior and decreased fear. And during that time, they can learn to normalize like a lot of different things. And if they experience it, those things during that time, um, then they can feel like they're normal as they get older. And if you do a really good job socializing, then you actually teach them that change is normal and that things that are different aren't scary. And so it's almost like you're creating categories in their brain for reference for later that this is not a scary thing. And that's not to say that as soon as the critical socialization period is done, that the door is shut and you can't change them at all and you can't move them around with training, but it's not as easy. You sort of are supercharged to do that when they're in that early critical socialization period. Mm -hmm. So probably Johnny didn't have, he definitely didn't have as good an experience as Grumpkin did because Grumpkin, we got at three weeks old. So she was with us, you know, getting bottle fed. And she had litter mates when, when we had her. What's that? She had litter mates when we had her. So she had was, litter mates. Yeah. Socialization. And honestly, Johnny, you could potentially argue that he maybe got better socialization with animals when he was younger because he lived with his mom. So he had a mom and he is typically better with other cats that we bring in the house. Mm -hmm. So when we have foster kittens, he's usually more gentle with them and more playful. So, you know, I think to get to the other part of your question are some animals more intelligent than others? I think I will challenge you a little bit to say, I don't think there's one intelligence mm -hmm. for people or for animals, you know, for people, we've got like emotional intelligence and all these different types. I think it's not as simple as she's smart. He's not smart. I think it's more complicated than that. And I mean, that brings me to the overarching point, which is every animal is an individual. So you could have, a border collie who's really lazy and takes a while to learn things. And you could have a pug who is like a tricks champion. So it's, you know, the breed does, each breed of animal does perhaps have different breed tendencies. They're more genetically primed to be a certain way, but each animal is an individual. And so you have to consider that by looking at the individual in front of you and not saying, well, he's a beagle. I don't understand why he doesn't like other dogs. Beagles like other dogs. Yeah, yeah, that actually segues and partially answers, I guess, another question, um, which is, you know, if are certain are, are certain breeds like what is the real difference between the breeds and behavior? Are certain breeds, you know, more apt to uh, take to training, better with children? Are certain breeds more dangerous to humans than than other breeds? Are oh, you talking about cat breeds? <laughs> Talk about dog breeds here. I know. I know. Um, well, for cat breeds, they're actually, their behavior is not as different as dog breeds. And cats haven't been domesticated as long as dogs. And I think the key is different cat breeds, for the most part, weren't bred to do different jobs like the different dog breeds. Mm -hmm. So the different dog breeds have some breed tendencies based on why they were historically bred to be a breed. So, you know, we have an English setter. She is going to be more likely to, you know, creep up to something and then freeze than a Springer Spaniel who's closely related, but was bred to actually chase something and flush it. So they might creep, but then chase the thing instead of freezing. And, um, you know, other breeds were originally bred to pull carts or to guard things. And you definitely can see some breed tendencies in some breeds, but I, again, always look at the individual. So, um, you know, I have met some really, really lovely golden retrievers and I, some of the most aggressive puppies I've ever seen, like, you know, like dogs under four months were golden retrievers. Mm -hmm. So it's not, um, it's not as clear cut, I think, as people think. And I, I think it's not, it's not as clear cut as saying that there are no breed tendencies because there are breed tendencies. There are definitely certain behaviors, like I said, you know, I just described with the two bird dogs, uh, but it's not as simple as it's just how they were raised. Um, so for an example, here at the shelter, sometimes we get dogs, we have a, a law enforcement department and we get dogs who have, we know have been victims of animal cruelty. 
And if it was all just how they were raised, then those dogs would be, you know, so mean. They would be so aggressive to humans. Uh, but sometimes those dogs are super nice. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're really, really sweet dogs. And so it's not it's not all genetics. It's not all just how they were raised. It's not all breed. It's not all socialization. It's this complicated mix of things, um, including their health status. So, you know, you can see a lot of behavior change because of different medical problems. So behavior is pretty complicated and personality is complicated too. And, you know, there are some things, so within the personality literature, temperament are kind of the things that don't change about you. And personality are the things that can sort of change about you as you grow and learn. Um, but it, it is really different for every dog and cat and cow and whatever. So I always try to look at, you know, the individual in front of me and what are the behavior needs for that individual versus, well, he's a boxer. So I know he's going to do X, Y, Z. If he's a boxer and he likes slapping other dogs with his feet, I'm not going to be surprised, but I'm not going to, you know, necessarily be surprised if I don't see that either. Mm -hmm. um, so, so speaking of taking each animal uh, individually, uh, one of the things you and your department do at the shelter are uh, behavioral evaluations. Um, can you talk about what that is and kind of how they work? Yeah, I mean, it's so behavior evaluations are just a tool for shelters to get a snapshot in time of a dog's behavior. Um, cats, too. We're here at Lollipop, we only do canine behavior evaluations. Um, we don't have the staff time to do cat behavior evaluations, but we did at the previous shelter that I worked at. Um, so it's basically everyone gets a standardized evaluation. The one that we use actually had a really good validation study done on it by Kelly Bolin um, and a co-author Horowitz. I'm not sure what that person's first name is. Um, so basically the evaluation that we do, you put the dog in a variety of circumstances, like you pet them all over, you um, introduce them to another dog, you introduce them to a new person, things like that. And we are looking for any really lowered thresholds for aggression. So if, any of these common things trigger severe aggression, then that would be something that would concern us. And we would either need to put them in our behavior modification plan, or if it's really severe, we might uh, put them to sleep. Uh -huh. So um, it's a standardized set of tests, but it basically, it's an information gathering thing. So I liken it to a medical exam. So if, if, you see an animal and a veterinarian is coming in to do a little exam on them. It's sort of the same thing. You're looking for issues and you're looking, if you find an issue, you're looking to see like what's going to be the best solution for this, or is this an issue that makes this animal not safe for placement in our community? And typically if we see that there's correlation between the animal's history or other behavior we've seen at the shelter as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so what, what are some common uh, misperceptions about animal shelters that the general public might hold? Um, well, we actually just did a week of Facebook polls about this very topic on oh, yeah. our Lollipop Farm Facebook page. So everyone can go check those out. Okay, if they we'll, we'll put that link below. Um, but a lot of ones that I hear in my line of work are that we only have bully breed mixes, which isn't true. We get a huge wide variety of breeds through the shelter and we get purebred dogs all the time. Um, we get little dogs all the time, but they usually get adopted faster. Um, so they cycle through faster and they don't stay at the shelter as long. And sometimes our bully breed friends stay a little bit longer, not always. Sometimes they get snapped up right away too. But I think the perception is, you know, that they're the ones who are here the most, but it's really not, it's not really the case. We get a wide variety of breeds. Uh, there's another perception out there that a lot of shelters have uh, like time limits, like you have to come in and adopt the animal or after like 60 days, the shelter will just euthanize the animal. And that is definitely not the case here. And I think it's not the case at most shelters today. I mean, you know, regionally shelters are dealing with very different issues. So like the Northeast and the Southeast have very different issues um, that they're dealing with. Um, and time limits aren't something that 
lollipop farm does at all, but it is still out in the community occasionally that people will say, well, don't they only have 30 days? And it's like, no, I mean, we've had dogs stay here for almost a year or more Mm -hmm. um, and cats, you know, longer than that, uh, waiting to get adopted. And usually the ones who have trouble getting adopted um, have severe medical or behavioral issues. So they're here receiving a lot of care and treatment. um, And it's a lot for somebody to take on. So we care for them until we can find people to take that over. Mm -hmm. Um, can you uh, just briefly talk about the difference between a um, open admission and a no-kill shelter? Uh, sure. Uh, really briefly, though. So no-kill is a term that was created, and it means a, something different to every shelter that uses it. So it's kind of this umbrella term. At this point in time, I feel it's more of a marketing term than an actual statement about the shelter's practices because some people, some shelters will not euthanize anything at all. Um, Some have um, euthanasia standards that are very similar to what we have at Lollipop Farm. So animals who are sick and or injured and are unlikely to make a full recovery or or, or are suffering or have a poor quality of life um, or animals who are too aggressive to be rehomed in the community safely. Um, so there are some shelters who say no kill, but they still do euthanize. So it's it doesn't mean one thing to every person. It means something different to every person. And open admission is really just a description of your admission policies. So what often happens is that in order to be no kill, you do have to restrict intake because um, it it really depends on your practices within the shelter. But if you're a shelter who really doesn't euthanize, then your cages are going to fill up really quickly. Your kennels are going to fill up really quickly and you're not going to have the space to take in more animals uh, because you're, you know, you have really sick animals that you're trying to treat and who aren't ready for adoption. We, I think, strike a really great balance. We um, are helping so many animals, but we do get some animals. I mean, I talked before about we get animals from really, really far distances. And a lot of that is because every other shelter between here and Pennsylvania, here in Long Island, which is an over-exaggeration, but we're one of the few open admission shelters in this region. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that means we're not going to turn someone away. We're not going to say we're full. And, um, you know, a lot of people will get turned away from these other limited admission shelters and make their way to us as an open admission shelter. So often limited admission and no kill go hand in hand, but it's not a one to one for sure. Um, And it's a sticky subject because the word is out there and people sort of expect a shelter to be that. But the words don't actually have a unified definition. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, one of those things where it doesn't mean the same thing to every person, but it sounds good, right? Like you wouldn't want to say you were pro kill. Like that doesn't sound good. It's one (laughs) of those sort of terms that like, I mean, it's like pro life. No one's anti life, no kill. No one's pro kill. Right. Um, But I think, you know, I'm definitely one for responsible sheltering. So I don't think it's, um, I don't think that no euthanasia is a good idea because if an animal is sick or suffering or is so um, aggressive that they can't safely live in a home, I don't think living in a kennel or dying overnight from a, you know, a chronic disease is the right way for a companion animal to live or to die. I mean, we can give them a better ending than that. They don't have to so those are my thoughts in brief on yeah, the subject, yeah. but it's a very complicated subject and it's definitely one that sheltering is going to be, I think, struggling with and hashing out for years to come. Mm-hmm. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about uh, the kind of training you do uh, with, with clients and what, like what's what, and maybe give like an, an example of a, the kind of case that you might get called for and how you would 
advise them to proceed? So I, so I think you mean like a one-on-one -on -one client, like a behavior yeah. consultation. So I see clients through the shelters, not just animals who were adopted from Lollipop Farm, but um, just people who got their dog or cat from wherever and are now having behavior issues. They call up and schedule a lesson and I'll see, um, I'll see dogs and cats. Typically, probably the number one issue I see dogs for is overreacting to other dogs. So things like barking, growling, lunging when other dogs walk by or just pulling towards them or going crazy. I also see a lot of cases of um, aggression to people coming into the house. So aggression to visitors. So, you know, every case, again, is unique. Every learner is different. Every family is different with how uh, complicated a plan they can handle and do. And, you know, so what's going to work for them is going to be different for every every person. But we always are keeping that humane hierarchy in mind. And we're always using least intrusive training methods possible to get the job done. Um, for cats, the common ones that I see are introduction issues. So they bring in a new cat and the um, resident cats or cat don't get along with the new cat. So I see clients for that um, or litter box issues. So uh, litter box avoidance is probably the number two thing that I get called on for um, cat behavior consultations. Mm -hmm. And again, in, you know, every individual case is different but we keep the same principles in mind. So we're gonna be using positive reinforcement in every case. We're probably gonna be using environmental management. So changing the environment to make the behavior that you want to change less likely to happen or have it happen less easily so that the animal's not practicing the behavior. Uh, we're probably gonna start reinforcing a different behavior so that that behavior becomes the behavior that they choose to do in that given circumstance. And we might be doing some counter conditioning or desensitization. Um, but there are sort of overarching principles that we always use, but each case is very specific and individualized for that family and that environment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's, there was an essay that was in, was there an essay or a video that ran in the times in the past couple of months by Amanda Hess, who does these videos about like internet culture she talked about how um, uh, back in the day, in the old, the original internet, um, cats were, you know, like the, in charge. And everyone, you know, the, the thing was like, when people do online, they look at cat photos. And uh, somehow that, that seemed to make sense back then. Um, but there's been some kind of cultural shift. And now it's dogs that people uh, really like to talk about online and look at photos of. So there's this, uh, you know, very popular... Uh, social media phenomenon called we rate dogs um that maybe people have seen there's like they're on twitter instagram there's a facebook page and they always um they <laughs> grump getting her talking about cats yeah, and she just has some thoughts on this yeah she, she has some ratings for one dog that she knows um and yeah. so the the joke is that the, uh the rating is all so dusty aria brush your cat that's a good question um the dog is always at least 10 out of 10, often 12, 13, or 15 out of 10, based on how good the dog is. And the way this guy, it's run by a guy who's like 21 years old and like dropped out of college to pursue this as a full-time job. And he's, he's a very talented, clever guy. And he like kind of created this or absorbed this uh, style of speaking of like talk, calling them doggos and saying they're like small, S-M-O-L. And this has been picked up by other dog communities. And there are, you know, there's lots of people talking about this now and, I, I have a Facebook group I belong to called Dog Spotting, where people take photos of dogs they see out and about, and often they will say, you know, 15 out of 10, you know, love this small pupper, <laughs> this kind of stuff. I mean, do you have any, <laughs> you have any thoughts on this as someone who deals with, like, a ton of, of dogs um, in your line of work? I don't know, there's, there's, there's something, like, kind of odd about it, but, like, it's fun, and, like, dogs are beautiful creatures, and puppies are adorable, and, but then there's also something like, Oh, they're all good boys. That's like another, that's like another trope of this kind of community or subculture. Like, you know, all dogs are good, but clearly not like, are all, all dogs good? <laughs> do all dogs go to heaven? What, what, what do you think? I mean, I don't think that's the right question. I don't think, uh, I'm, I'm not into labels, man. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I don't 
like to say, oh, that's a good dog. Oh, that's a bad dog. Oh, that's a fearful dog. Oh, that's an aggressive dog. Oh, that's a, you know, over whatever. But yeah, I don't like labels. I mean, I like descriptions of behavior. Um, you know, we could say this dog is showing some aggressive behaviors like growling or showing teeth or freezing when you go to touch the rawhide that he's chewing on. I think that's much more descriptive than saying he's a bad dog because he does this. And in terms of um, why that's so popular, uh, I mean, because it's adorable and cute and it's fun and it's, you know, a natural thing to gravitate to. I mean, dogs and puppies and cats and kittens are freaking adorable. And why not look at more pictures of them or at least have them break up your news feed so that you're seeing these like cute animal pictures and getting that little jolt of, you know, happy brain chemicals that we get from our pets uh, when we see pictures of them. And in terms of like, I haven't read this article that you're referring to. I don't think I have, but you know, get tapped into the cat internet because the cute cat accounts are out there too. <laughs> Maybe they haven't entered pop culture, you know, as much as the doggos, but there are plenty of really adorable and funny cat accounts out there to follow. Yeah, that's true. And well, one we both follow is an Instagram account called cats are such dicks, which is sometimes yeah. just cute pictures of cats, but is other times pictures of cats looking weird or misbehaving or something. And mm -hmm. I don't know if like the account dogs are such dicks. Would, I'm sure there's like a dog misbehaving in a funny way account also, but like right. the, the account well, that dog shaming is kind of that. Right. The account that right. took off was this one that's like every dog is superlative, you know, and always right. rates above right. 10 out of 10 at least. Well, I think there's the common, you know, I think people tend to assign different motives to dogs and cats overall. You know, it's that whole video of like the roommate who's a dog and the roommate who's a cat. Right. Um, and the cat roommate is like super weird and is always like leaving the room quickly. But again, it all goes back to, it's an overgeneralization of cats, like, and of dogs. Like there are some cats who are super dog-like and greet people at the door and welcome them in and show them around and bring them toys and want to engage with people they don't know like that. And there are dogs who want to avoid new people and hide when people are over and, you know, act in a cat-like way. So, um, I think the world is the world is wide and uh, there's room enough for all kinds of doggos, all creatures, big and small, adorable cats, um, both, you know, social and not social weird. And I don't know. They're all weird. I was going <laughs> to say not weird, but they're all weird. That's the other thing that I know is that every animal has their particular quirks. And that's okay. That's just part of having an animal. You know, Grumpkin likes to parade around on top of the laptop and constantly force the laptop off your lap. And <laughs> that's who she is. That's one of the things she does. And it's cute and annoying. And that's part of having a little wild animal in your house. Right. Um, I like what you said about, you know, avoiding labels. And it made me think, uh, it reminded me of Buddhism, just in my lay understanding of Buddhism of like, you know, the idea that there's like no essence in things. It's just like what the, what we apply to it. And so is yeah those you can't say like this is inherently a bad creature this is inherently a good creature uh, yeah. th those are like constructs that we lay on top of the existence of things um can yeah you... i mean I, I totally agree with that like i don't think i think people tend to assign a lot of motives to their animals as well that are not accurate you know they'll say oh he did this because he was mad at me um and it's usually much less complicated yeah, that was actually another one of my questions. Like, so there's this dog shaming thing, and it's like, and a popular type of photograph that goes viral is like, you know, the dog ripped open the uh, garbage bag or something, and is sitting in the middle of it and looking like either like totally happy or like shame faced and like, oh, I know what I did. But re but does the dog, as we understand it, experience either of those? Like, do they, can they know they've done something bad and then they put their head down because they're feeling shame or they're just like conditioned to put their head down because it gets a kind of reaction from us? Yeah, the latter. So there was actually a really clever study done about this and they looked at dogs and the 
there were, the owner would set a cookie on the table and say, leave it to the dog. And then they would leave, the owner would leave the room. And then the researchers either let the dog eat the cookie or not. And then when the person came back in, the only way you could trigger a guilty reaction from the dog was if the researcher told the person that the dog ate the cookie when they were asked not to. It didn't matter if the dog actually ate the cookie or not. Mm -hmm. But dogs are picking up on your body language. And when you're angry, they're going to show certain behaviors. So a lot of those guilty looking behaviors, the like squinting and lowered head, and sometimes they show their teeth um, are all appeasement behaviors. So if you're trying to like diffuse the tension with another dog who's like a little bit too much or is maybe getting, you know, you're a little bit nervous of them. Those are some behaviors that you're going to do. And those translate to our primate brains as those are guilty behaviors. That's the dog is doing that because they're guilty, but really just picking up on the fact that you're upset and they're doing that. So it's not really about whether or not in the study show, it wasn't whether or not they actually did the behavior because if the owner came back in and the researcher said, nope, he didn't eat the cookie, he was so good, then the dog who did eat the cookie would just be gallivanting around and being happy and not being guilty. Like, so, you know, they don't, the dogs can't understand the English uh, in that interchange. They don't know that their owner doesn't know that they did eat the cookie. They are just picking up on the owner's body language. Mm -hmm. Did I explain that okay? Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. Uh, so something, I guess, a little similar is um, calming signals. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain those? Yeah, uh, but then I actually have to go because I have to. Um, I have some potential adapters coming in to meet. Okay, we'll do, we'll do this question and then one more question, and then we'll say we'll say goodbye. Okay, so this question I'll just answer super easily. Um, we'll put a link below for a book called Calming Signals that explains all about what they are. It's a small book. If you have a dog and you've never read a dog book before, it's a cool book to read. Basically, these are behaviors. Some, I mean, you could argue, too, they're stress-related behaviors, but they're behaviors that dogs do um, when they're feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and it's they're subtle things, but it's really cool to start to pick up on them. So things like licking their lips or looking away deliberately, um, moving slowly. So if you can start to tune into your dog's stress signals early on, um, they can don't they don't have to escalate to further behaviors like aggressive type behaviors. Um, so read the book if you're interested. That would be my answer. Uh, but yes, stress signals or calming signals are good to learn for whatever companion animal you're living with. Because if you start to see that your companion animal is stressed, then you should make some interventions, whether it's changing the environment or just getting them out of that situation so that they feel more comfortable before they escalate to showing you in bigger, larger behaviors, more, um, you know, energetic behaviors that they're not happy with what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Final question. So the, um, you know, when you, uh, come home from work every day, um, our dog Lima, um, does, uh, basically the, like if, if you've ever, if people in the audience have ever seen those videos of like soldiers coming back, um, from Afghanistan or Iraq and they greet their dog at the door and the dog is like, you know, unbelievably happy uh that's the kind of thing that our dog lima does uh when becca comes home uh, uh you know from work every day and she is like so lima is so happy to uh see you and it's, it's always cute and funny when she you know runs through the door and um is, is just so excited so like do we have any idea like like why why do these creatures like why does like i think lima like loves you and like is close to loving me. She loves you more. Like she, she's more into, she's more into you than she's into me. You know, she's never done anything bad to me or anything, but she, um, she's like, she loves you. Like, do we have any idea? Like, where does this come from? Is this real? Are we, is this, is this a label I'm, I'm putting, I'm putting on it? She just knows you're the one who is most consistently going to give her, uh, affection and food. And she, and you, you know, you uh, were living alone when you, uh, got Lima at the beginning. So she kind of bonded with you more than, she bought it with me when I, you know, I moved in a couple of months later. Um, but yeah, like, like this creature has, you know, a very, very strong connection to you. Like, where did that come from? How do you, how do you think about that? So, I mean, that's a really complicated question. Like what is love is basically <laughs> what Baby, don't hurt me. Yeah, well, what is, what is love when a dog, you know, I think we know, you know, 
love between people and or maybe or even love for a human for an animal what is like what do you think is happening for the, the animal towards the human i mean you know a lot of times in animal behavior we talk about the human animal bond more than we talk about like love between two creatures but i think again it's just a different label but i think you could argue I think one could argue, I don't know that I'm the one to make this argument, but I think one could argue that, you know, what is love in humans is the same as love in dogs is just a strong history of positive reinforcement, right? Mutual positive reinforcement. And, um, you know, I think that's the way that I operationalize relationship also when it comes to humans and companion animals. Um, a good relationship is one with a strong history of positive reinforcement. And I, you know, I think, yeah, I'm a huge positive reinforcement opportunity for Lima. <laughs> I think that's why she gets excited to see me every time. And I think, you know, not only that, is I reinforce her greetings. So if I stopped, you know, cooing to her and petting her, every time I walked in, eventually she would stop doing it. And does that indicate that she feels differently about me or that that particular behavior stopped getting reinforced and so stopped happening? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, it depends on how like cold hearted you want to be about it. But, um, you know, I think living with companion animals is so fun and I think it's a pleasure and a privilege to get to help people have better relationships, better, you know, histories of positive reinforcement with their animals, because then their animals are happier and they're happier too. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that it's something that necessarily needs to be examined as closely as maybe you want to examine it. Well, yeah. So you're, uh, so you're, you know, you were the um, science major in college and I was the uh, English major in college. Um, but I think it's science. You may, I'm, okay. well, but you know, biology, ecology, and evolutionary biology. But you are yeah. in, in the scientific uh, part of the curriculum, and it's just like I don't know if, if we think that the animals can experience emotions close to us, then maybe we it changes how we think about how we should treat them. Um, you know, if you wouldn't like uh, smack a your, I mean, some people obviously do smack their children or something uh, when they know there's a a, a strong bond there. Um, they shouldn't maybe smack their dog either for that reason. Although of course there's other <laughs> more practical and consequential reasons not to uh, smack anyone. Um, but yeah, it's just like, what do we, I don't know what, you know, it, it's like you can think about it for, for a long time. These creatures are strange and because of human history dating back, you know, tens of thousands of years, like we have this responsibility to them and, um, and, but it's more than, you know, it's more than just that like taking care of them. It's like they return, you know, they return this affection in a very strong way. Uh, so maybe, maybe we can have another conversation at some point in which we get more, you know, uh, philosophical about, that, about these things. But, uh, but uh, Rebecca Lonis, uh, my beloved wife, uh, thank you for coming on. Finally, this, this idea has been in the air for, for years and years, but we're finally getting it done. Um, so you are, you are not on Twitter, um, uh, mm -hmm. but People Boo, can, Twitter. <laughs> but people can go to uh, the Lollipop website and see the kind of programs that your department offers. And is there anything, do you have anything you want to plug before we wrap up? Oh, the training challenge. Why don't you talk about the training challenge? Uh, the training challenge just ended, but um, <laughs> we'll post a link to, um, we have a sh video series of short, like 90 second videos that talk about some common pet behavior issues and how to deal with them. And then we did a six week training challenge that will also be a YouTube playlist that you can go through. And if you want to strengthen your bond with your companion animal, you can work through each week's challenge and make some changes and try some new things with your animal and hopefully come out with a better bond at the end. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, so here's one of those animals is right here. Trumpkin, can we get to there? There's a little bit of grumpy. That didn't really work. But anyway, um, <laughs> she's been sitting by my side. Uh, so loyal. Uh, what, a, what a loyal cat. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm putting labels yeah, on it. Okay, if we want to put like human attributes onto an animal. I mean, if Grumpkin's not a loyal cat, I don't know what a loyal cat looks like. <laughs> she loves like two humans in the world and everyone else she keeps a very close eye on and would, you know, 
slit their throat given half a chance. Okay, that's probably true. So uh, uh, thank you, Rebecca, for take, taking the time out of your busy schedule to come on. Uh, oh. th- thank you to all of our listeners and viewers. There's oh. Persephone. <laughs> there's, and there's a kitty uh, right behind you. So a rare blog news episode where people got glimpses of two cats. Um, yeah, so but not Persephone. <laughs> check the website, uh, lollipop.org. Is that it? Uh, and if you're in Western New York or anywhere near there, you can you can uh, uh, adopt a, a wonderful animal. Okay, well, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you again, Rebecca. Uh, and I'll see you very soon. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye.